If a masked killer starts targeting students who have dark secrets, including you, what do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made by the Osborne High School students, what you should do, and how to beat the masked killer in There's Someone Inside Your House. Before we jump in, I'm looking for some talented nerds to help me beat movie villains, monsters, apocalypses, and death games. You'd be working with me, dissecting movies and crafting scripts packed with survival strategies. If you're interested, shoot me an email at nerdexplainsbiz at gmail.com. A high school jock gets back to his rural home after class. He notices an odd egg-shaped timer on the counter ticking down and yells out to see if it's his mom or his sisters. Nobody else appears to be home. Kickoff's in a few hours, so he sets his alarm and hits the bed to rest up. A few hours later, he's woken up by that same egg-shaped timer, now sitting on his nightstand. How it got there, why someone put it there, and nobody being home immediately puts him on edge. Kickoff for his football game is in a few minutes, so he rushes downstairs with his bag to find the front door being left wide open and his truck gone. He runs back inside and dials 911, hanging up mid-call after noticing a picture of him and his buddy Macon he was talking to on the phone earlier. The phone starts ringing, probably the cops checking back in. Jackson's too distracted by the incriminating picture trail of himself hazing a fellow player named Caleb, leading to his parents' bedroom. He pumps himself up, then opens the door. There's nothing out of the ordinary. On cue, his phone's quacking ringtone starts playing in the closet. Now realizing this prankster might be playing for keeps, he arms himself with his dad's golf clubs and opens the closet door. It's covered in pictures of him beating Caleb's face in. There's a slight noise of some clothes hangers bumping into each other. Jackson fires off a mid-level swing that hits nothing. While he's distracted, his killer reaches out from floor level and slits both of his Achilles tendons. <laughs> Jackson cries out that he'll Venmo his attacker if it's about money, which clearly it isn't. This is personal. His attacker reveals himself, wearing his school hoodie and a mask of Jackson's own face, then plunges the knife deep into his heart. Jackson made a few key mistakes. Dumping the phone to follow a trail of incriminating photos after seeing the front door open was extremely foolish. You never, ever follow breadcrumb trails like this. It was obviously laid out to bait him into a kill zone, and Jackson took the bait like a dumb little mouse. The first thing he should have done was immediately gotten some distance away from his house while staying on the phone with the police, then had the police search his home to ensure no one uninvited was inside. This alone would have prevented his death. If he was intent on checking it out himself, he should have armed himself with a better weapon before following the evil jelly bean trail. The kitchen knife would have been better than a golf club in close quarters where you don't have space to wind up a driver. See, this is exactly why in the past I've mentioned that keeping a well-maintained, excruciatingly sharp set of knives in your kitchen is important. They'll make your meals effortless to prep, keep your fingertips where they should be, and should a masked killer with a grudge against you enter your home, save your life. That's why I keep Kamikoto in my kitchen's arsenal. Japanese steel forged into precise blades by generations of expert knifesmiths using traditional Japanese techniques. Kamikoto has a wide variety of knives, each tailor-made for a specific task in which comes in its own heavy-duty ash wood box. Let's start with the most popular Kanpeki knife set, which includes the 7-inch Nakiri vegetable knife, 8.5-inch slicing knife, and 5-inch utility knife to tackle the more intricate chores in the kitchen. Need more culinary firepower? Kanpeki knife set with a 7-inch Santoku multi-use knife and Toishi whetstone to keep the blade sharp enough to slice meat like butter. Then there's the 7.5-inch Chukabocho cleaver. Its substantial heft and weight can crush through the hardest bones and slash through the toughest cuts of animals. Every Kamikoto knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. These are quality knives you pass down to your kids. Both the Kempeki knife set and Chuka Bocho have a buy one get one free sale going on among other offers, which makes for a perfect gift. And if you buy now, they're offering you all an extra $50 off any purchase by using the discount code NerdExplains. Go to kamikoto.com slash NerdExplains. Click the link in the top right corner or in the description box below. Got your knives? Good. Now you're better prepared than Jackson. Opening the closet door to a literal dead end, decorated as a memorial of his sins, should have triggered the flight mode in his brain. I don't know how he could be so stupid as to not realize that this is a pre-planned kill box made specially for him. Jackson's absolute last chance to get out was when he heard the ruffling at the end of the closet. He could have split and survived, or at least backed out slowly. Instead, he walked into the middle of the closet and took a mid-height swing to the clothes with his club. I guess I also have to point out that if an attacker was hiding in the closet, 
there's a good chance that they're lying on the ground to not be seen, and so they can see his foot movements. Shouldn't be too much to ask for Jackson to check low. He can run pigskin, but he's not very smart. As for the killer, it was dumb to leave the phone lines intact and hide in a closet with no alternate escape route. If Jackson had left and called the police, the killer could have gotten trapped. Just think, they're sitting in the closet behind a bunch of clothes with a hoodie and mask, obscuring their vision and hearing. Waiting, waiting, waiting for Jackson to hopefully be stupid enough to follow the trail, not knowing how long it's taking him, where he is, or what he's doing. All it'd take is 10 minutes for a cop to show up and Jackson to show him the trail to the closet. Meanwhile, Jackson's family's at the football game, wondering where he is. While Caleb goes for the touchdown, everyone at the football game gets a text with a video of Jackson beating him up. Jackson's parents return home shortly after to find their murdered son in the closet. The entire school starts speculating about why Jackson beat Caleb, why Caleb never reported it, who murdered Jackson since Caleb was playing in the game during Jackson's murder, and why the murderer sent the video to everyone. At one table with Makani, Darby, Zach, and Alex, Zach is joking about how it was a secret plot his farm owner father created to get Jackson's family to sell their house on the cheap. Caleb isn't welcomed at the player's table, so Darby invites him to sit at their table. Across from them in the corner of the cafeteria, a loner kid named Ollie shoots Makani a smile. Alex makes a comment about how he's the most likely suspect, rumoring that his parents left him since he was a sociopath. It obviously wasn't Caleb since he was playing in the football game at the time of Jackson's murder. I also don't think Caleb hired a killer. The murder scene was far too elaborate, personal, and calculated to be a simple hit. Caleb having the rock solid alibi means this was wasn't a frame job to mask the real reason Jackson was murdered. Supposedly, only members of the football team were present for the beating. The killer either was on the football team, or the beating was leaked and the killer found it. I don't think the killer was a member of the football team. The murder was very calculated, which means the killer is smart enough to not link himself too closely with the victim, but the killer had to have been proximate enough to have gotten the leaked video. The pictures are a link, though. The murder scene feels like a dramatic juvenile's doing, one interested in theatrics, the show. Most people or serial killers would get straight to indulging in their hedonistic pleasure. The killer might have been able to use a white pages type app and some software to find and mass text everyone simultaneously. It's hard to narrow the search much based on this. The killer most likely used burner phones and a no log VPN to mask their identity. No, this isn't a sponsor segue. I'd reckon the killer is an Osborne student, male because 90% of murderers are male, nerd level intelligence, has a thirst for drama or attention, talks about the killer to too much, has a poor relationship with his parents or a troubled childhood, also like a lot of serial killers, is not a member of the football team, and couldn't be directly connected with his victims. The police should start with questioning the football team to uncover how, who, or where the video was leaked to, as well as gather a list of people matching the killer's profile who weren't at the game and what their alibis were. There's not that many students in the small town of Osborne, so this shouldn't be a long list. Later that night, while Makani is writing a new poem, she gets a text from Ollie asking her if she's writing a new poem. Strange, but as it turns out, Makani and Ollie were lovers some time ago. Could have been a lucky guess. A couple minutes later, he fires off another irresistibly charming text that will totally reseduce Makani. She ignores it and falls asleep. Makani wakes up from the jingles rattling on her grandma's door, which they added to alert Makani when her grandma is sleepwalking, as she habitually does. She goes to the kitchen, since that's where her grandma typically sleepwalks to. Gram Gram's not there. There's flowers in the oven and the front door is left wide open. Makani takes a look outside. Graham's not out there either. Maybe she opened the door then wandered somewhere else in the house. <gasps> God damn it, Gam. Ollie's text asking if she's writing a new poem while she was writing a new poem is pretty coincidental. His quick follow-up text telling her she can't ignore him after she ignored him was also pretty coincidental. She didn't leave him on read. She didn't even open the text up. It was like he knew she ignored it. He could be stalking her. Makani should have checked her room for hidden cameras. I just watched a video about all the locations Airbnb hosts hide secret cameras to see what their tenants are up to. Some are quite clever. The bell on Graham's door to wake her up or Makani when she sleepwalks didn't work too well. If anything, Graham should wear a little cat bell bracelet when she goes to sleep so Makani can easily find her and not have a heart attack when Graham suddenly appears behind her. Even though Graham was likely the one that opened the door, there is a serial killer on the loose, so it would be wise to thoroughly check the house afterwards and let the police know that there was potentially a break-in. The next morning, Katie, the school's obliviously arrogant valedictorian, is preparing the memorial service. She thinks that from her 
true crime experience, Caleb must have hired a killer. When she asks her friend Marcus, who's handling the projector, what he thinks, he isn't there. Moments later, Marcus texts her that he's sick and can't help out with a memorial. The projector and sound system starts playing a white supremacist podcast she was on, with her speaking about justifications for segregation. Katie turns around to find a hooded person wearing a mask of her own face, wielding a large knife, standing feet away from her behind a few rows of benches. Katie hopelessly makes excuse after excuse, realizing the masked attacker isn't sheathing their knife. She runs for the exit doors, but they're locked. The attacker slashes her stomach open and retreats to let her crawl around in agony. Katie gets up and sees the attacker patiently waiting. She runs for the confession box and dials 911, telling them the killer is at the church, wearing a mask of her own face. Her call is cut short. It's a paid speech and I... <laughs> The townsfolk arrive and open up to the scene of Katie's bloody corpse, hanging at the altar with her hate speech playing in the background. Katie probably should have used a voice masker and VPN to hide her identity. Again, not a sponsor segue. Simply not adding her name to what's an incredibly offensive podcast while still using her unaltered voice was foolish. The stakes are high. Murder wasn't on her mind, but all of her future career prospects would have vanished instantly if she was found out. Katie couldn't have known that she was going to be targeted, especially in a church minutes before crowd arrived. When she turned around to see the blade-wielding masked killer, they had a few rows of benches between each other. This is the same killer that orchestrated Jackson's murder. They rigged the projector, planned out the timing of the crowds, made sure Marcus would call in sick, and presented themselves at a distance with Katie closer to the exit. Based on this quick mental assessment, the doors are likely locked. Running to them would enable the killer to corner her in a dead end. This is gonna sound stupid, but honestly, the best she could hope for is to scream and play Ring Around the Rosie with the benches. The service is supposed to begin shortly, so she just needs to buy a few minutes of time before the attacker is forced to retreat, lest their getaway is compromised by the crowds. Calling 911 and giving them details like how the killer was wearing a mask of her own face was never going to help her survive, and it's not all too helpful for the police either. For all they know, the killer glued a picture of their victim's face to a hockey mask. Katie said nothing to indicate that he was wearing high-quality masks that were 3D printed using facial scans. The police should focus on how the killer knew Marcus was going to call in sick. The timing seems impossible to coordinate. The killer must have caused Marcus to become sick with a non-lethal poison. They should question him to see who he came into contact with and where he ate the night before. Katie and Jackson were both seniors at Osborne High. Our killer's profile is still consistent. Everyone, including Makani, is reflecting on their past sins, wondering if they will be targeted next by the killer. The sheriffs enact a citywide 8 p.m. curfew and are looking into any and all leads, starting with finding out why both victims were seniors at the high school. The police bring in all seniors for interrogation, each senior paranoid that the killer might be in the same room with them. Rodrigo and Alex still think it's one of the football players, citing lack of eye contact and fidgeting as telltale signs. Zach, on the other hand, suspects the sheriff is behind all this, since there's a referendum to dissolve the police department next month to replace them with private security. Solving a series of murders would make a strong case to keep them in business. Everyone but Zach is too stupid to invoke their constitutional right to keep their mouths shut in front of the police without a lawyer present. The remaining two people to be questioned are Makani and Ali, of course. Ali confronts Makani about using him as a crutch after the incident with the fire, then dumping him to the curb when she transferred schools so she could have a fresh start. Deputy Larson calls Makani in next and asks Ali, his little brother, if he saw anyone take his taser. Ali says he didn't. Larson asks Makani the usual questions. Did you notice anything strange? Did you know Katie and Jackson? Did you see them fight with anyone? Makani honestly denies all the above. I doubt it's the sheriff. The motive barely exists. They don't get paid nearly enough to warrant a serial killing to ensure their position. The method of the killings doesn't match up with this motive either. If it was about keeping their $20 an hour job, they'd be far more simplistic in the killings. The ostentatious nature and the embedded buildup to the actual murder is more indicative of a psychopath who enjoys their victim's anguish. By now, the killer is known to be pre-planning elaborate traps based on the victim's whereabouts or habits, attacking them when they're alone and isolated. Everyone needs to be using the buddy system everywhere they go, be more unpredictable in their daily routines or scheduled activities, and under no circumstances should people follow strange trails of incriminating evidence. Makani was swooned by Ali's nostalgic loner vibes and they break curfew by getting reacquainted in the Crown Vic. They aren't the only ones breaking curfew. Makani gets a text that there's going to be a rager at Zach's dad house while he's away. Ali and Makani arrive at the party. Everyone is telling their secrets as a way to somehow dis
dissolve the killer's motive to reveal someone's sins as justification for their murder. Makani gets swept up by her friends, ditching Ollie yet again. Makani's tolerant friends make fun of Ollie for being a friendless, creepy, school shooter icon sociopath while she sits idly by. Can we help you? Yeah, you. Hey man, everyone knows you're a sociopath. <laughs> Bro. All her friends go around the circle telling their harmless secrets, including Makani, who only reveals that she <gasps> writes poetry. Zack grabs everyone's attention and announces that he turned his dad's 10th largest Nazi memorabilia collection into drug paraphernalia as an F.U. to his abusive, ill-intentioned father. Alex and Rodrigo slip away for a minute to relieve the tension between them. When they step back out to the party, Rodrigo spots a trail of painkiller pills, just like the ones he's been secretly popping. Everyone at the party gets a text with a badly photoshopped meme of Rodrigo's drug addiction and starts making fun of him. So much for everyone telling secrets and being tolerant. Oh my god. A kid I don't know at all is allegedly taking a painkiller for a reason nobody knows which could be totally legit. What a junkie. I guess it is a high school full of immature, insecure kids. A few seconds later, the power to the house shuts off. One of the jocks yells that he saw someone wearing a mask of Rodrigo's face, causing mass panic. Rodrigo loses his friends and sees the killer chasing him. He ducks into a closet, but is made when the killer texts him again, sounding his ringtone. Rodrigo narrowly escapes through the ventilation shaft with the killer thrusting the knife at him. He gets out into the front courtyard, but is tasered by the killer, who then shoves a bottle of painkillers in his mouth and slits his throat. <laughs> secret telling party idea isn't going to work. Nobody will be telling their actual dark secret, and even if they did, it's not nearly public enough for what the killer is after. It's not a terrible idea though. Being extremely open about the wrong you've done would make the killer's crescendo anticlimactic. Since they have a flair for drama and attention, this could diffuse their plan. Making fun of the loner who you think is a sociopathic school shooter type and suspect might be the killer was the dumbass move of all dumbass moves. After everyone gets thoroughly intoxicated, also a bad idea with a serial killer on the loose, and Rodrigo finds a trail of painkillers he's secretly popping, he makes the same stupid mistake of following it. Pure chaos was inevitable once the lights went out and someone saw the masked killer. Hiding in the closet to avoid being trampled with a killer behind you was understandable. However, keeping his back up to the flimsy closet door is painfully stupid. The killer could easily thrust a knife through it like he did Katie in the confession booth. Forgetting to put his phone on silent was also understandable, and a smart move moved by the killer. When Rodrigo made it out into the courtyard, he should have been sprinting and yelling the whole time. Why he was power walking like a middle-aged woman with a killer after him, I don't know. The police now have three victims, all seniors in school, with evidence that Rodrigo was tasered before getting his throat slit. In Makani and Friend's view, Ollie is highly suspicious. Rodrigo was murdered after calling Ollie a sociopath. Again, I think this is too obvious. The killer knows better than to murder someone he had an overt conflict with. The killer's profile is honestly matching up with Zack here. Troubled youth with abusive parents, he's never had a direct conflict with any of the victims, he's not a football player, he's also a young male and senior at Osborne, he self-hosted a party which was about the killer's motives, his theatrics and thirst for attention, nerd-level tinkering to turn Nazi memorabilia into paraphernalia, and coincidentally getting everyone intoxicated minutes before the murder. Zack's family's loaded and connected enough to run the background checks, he can afford the printer ink for all those pictures, and would have access to a 3D printer. It'd be worth it for the police to at least stake out his house and follow him around from a distance for a while. They should also check for any signs of the power being cut from the outside versus the inside. I suppose it wouldn't be hard for the killer to find the main electrical panel, but it'd be easier for Zack. The school takes a month off for everyone to grieve and calm their nerves. The paranoia and speculation hasn't stopped though. Alex is confident that Ali killed Rodrigo for calling him a sociopath at the party, and tagged his locker with the word murderer so everyone else would become suspicious of him too. She points to the fact that the killer had a police taser. Ollie lives with his deputy brother and would have access to one, as well as background checks and potentially phone numbers. Zach adds that Katie's podcast was anonymous, and the killer, with police authority, could request connection logs from ISPs. Makani's fed up with the accusations against her secret lover and goes home. Ollie shows up and takes her out to the cornfields. The romance gets extinguished pretty quick when Makani hops back in the car while Ollie takes a call and finds the police taser in his glove box. She quickly closes it and pretends she didn't see it. She 
she curiously diverts the conversation to the death of his parents. Ollie says his parents were drunks who crashed into a tree, which people rumored as being a double suicide because their kid Ollie had behavioral issues. Ollie reveals that he knows Makani's real name, her secret. Makani's mad that he ran a background check on her and scared about the mounting possibility of Ollie being the killer as her friends suggested. Gotta say, Ollie's not looking too good right now either. Aside from a few things, he fits the killer's profile pretty well too. Maybe I'm giving the killer too much credit here, but leaving a murder weapon in your glove box with someone like Makani coming and going would be reckless. Regardless, the police or, since Ollie's the deputy's brother, Makani and her friends should stake him out as well. Makani hires the one Uber driver in town to take her home. He's a bit on the creepy side, opinionated about the deaths, and asks too many prying questions, like if she's home alone. Makani is justifiably paranoid with Ollie, the creepy Uber driver, and her not-so-secret that's infinitely worse than Rodrigo's drug addiction. She watches Dave leave, then locks up, jams her bedroom door, and sets a large kitchen knife on her nightstand before falling asleep. None of these help. She wakes up to find her bedroom door ajar, and her knife gone. Graham isn't supposed to be back yet, nor would she have the ability or inclination to silently remove those items while Makani slept. She rushes downstairs to the kitchen to grab another knife and call the cops. The phone starts playing the court tapes of the incident involving her pushing her friend into a fire. This has all the signs of the killer set up before the murder. There's a fire in the living room covered in pictures of her badly burnt friend and her own mug shots. Before she has a chance to react, the infamous masked man smashes through the window and tasers her. While she's incapacitated on the ground, he douses her in lighter fluid and prepares to ignite her with flames from the fire. Makani is saved at the last second when Alex arrives at her house, causing the killer to get distracted for a second, giving Makani the opportunity to sweep his leg. The killer loses her mask in the process and flees the now compromised murder scene. Makani tells Alex she thinks it was Ollie. Makani lying to the Uber driver about her parents being home is refreshing. It'd be better if she wasn't actually home alone for real though. I know she's at odds with Alex, but given her change of heart about Ollie, I think they should sleep over together. And by sleep over, I mean take turns staying awake. Makani locking up, jamming the door, and putting a knife on her nightstand were all good moves. She also should have kept her phone on her, put Graham's jingles on her door, and slept in Graham's room instead, or not slept at all. Personally, I think a serial killer whacking all your classmates that have dark secrets, such as Makani, would warrant buying a shotgun and learning how to use it. The killer is known to use knives and toy with his victims. A shotgun would put you at a significant unfair advantage. Unfortunately, the killer is a goddamn ninja. He must have come in through her bedroom window or something. There's no way he opened the jam door without Makani waking up. Makani is the fourth person to see the trail laid out by the killer and completely fall for it. Why the fuck would you go into the room that was ceremonialized by an infamous serial killer? Makani should have immediately left her house through her window or the back door. Cautiously, I might add. The killer could be waiting out back with a taser. Makani got damn lucky that Alex showed up when she did. A few seconds later and she'd have been toast. This is why the buddy system is so effective. Facing off against two people is significantly more difficult and tends to ruin delicately planned surprises. Makani wakes up in the hospital surrounded by her friends, who tell her that the police have Ollie in custody. They all got the text about Makani's past, like all the killer's previous victims. Makani was trying out for varsity team at school. The seniors hazed her badly, forcing booze down their throats and dousing them with it, pitting them against each other to the point where one shoved Makani. In a drunken stupor, she pushed back. The girl, Jasmine, fell back into the bonfire and was horribly burned. Makani was put on trial. Her parents got divorced, and she left town to stay with her grandma in an attempt to start a new life. For some reason, everyone's taking a trip down to the Sanford Family Farm's cornfield for the annual fall harvest tradition. Makani's waiting at the school for Alex to come pick her up since she missed the bus. Darby texts her that Ollie was released right as he pulls into the parking lot. She runs back into the school where she bumps into Caleb. For a second, she thinks that he'd provide some safety. Everyone's outside. <laughs> killer places the knife in her hands and escapes as Ollie shows up. Ollie immediately calls the police and places pressure on Caleb's stomach wound. Jasmine definitely has a motive to hurt Makani back, but she'd have no reason to kill Jackson, Katie, and Rodrigo. Jasmine also lives in a distant town, so it'd be easy to confirm her alibi. Everyone's far too nonchalant with Ollie in custody. There isn't sufficient evidence he did it. He's just a suspect who's far from being convicted. When Makani saw Ollie roll up, she should have stayed in public open areas when she ran from him, running into an empty dark school 
school, the killer potentially on the loose isn't the brightest idea. Same with walking into a corn maze where you can't find your way out and the killer could come out of the corn from anywhere and cut you down. Caleb couldn't have done anything, nor Makani, Ollie, or her friends. The killer didn't lay out a trail or anything this time. He just showed up and ran Caleb through. This rules out Caleb and Ollie, and the rest of our friends, except for Zach. There can't be too many other angsty males fitting the killer's profile, which includes being around Caleb's height and fairly slim. The sheriff and Deputy Larson are sleeping on this case. I'm starting to agree with Zach's dad about overhauling the police department. McConney and her friends all figure that Zach and the others at the corn maze might be in grave danger. On their way to the festival, they get a call from Zach, telling them the whole field is on fire with everyone inside. The fire is raging out of control. McConney has the idea to drive Ollie's car through the maze to clear a straight path for everyone. The Crown Vic makes it pretty far, but gets stuck halfway in. They ditch the car to go find Zach. Makani with the knife, Ollie with the taser. The maze is full of slaughtered corpses, smoke and screams. They stumble across Macon and some other kids. Makani tells Alex and Darby to help them out of the maze while she and Ollie look for Zach. Makani and Ollie stumble through the maze until they find Zach's dad face to face with the killer. Killer takes his mask off. It's Zack. Ollie's taser fails to fire, so Zack runs him through with a sword. While Ollie's writhing on the ground, he goes on a monologue about how everyone is a hypocrite, hiding their wrongdoings and acting self-righteous. Honestly, the reasoning doesn't matter. It's all lame justifications for an undiagnosed psychopath to go on a killing spree. He intends to frame Makani for all this somehow. Ollie gets the taser working and fires a shot. It misses, but Makani is able to sink the knife into Zack. She finishes him off with a one-liner and a stab to the heart. Clearing a straight path through the maze with the car was a clever move. A bit dangerous since they easily could have run over some people, but it was probably worth a risk. They weren't going fast enough to insta-kill anyone. Mikani and Ollie were smart enough to bring the knife and taser. I just wish they invested in more firepower earlier on. I don't think running into the maze themselves was a good idea. They could easily get lost and become victims themselves. They're also still pretty ill-equipped to deal with a homicidal psychopath. I have to point out the sheer idiocy of the jock that still had his cool shades on at night in a smoke filled inferno maze. Zack's dad couldn't have done anything, and his private security understandably left the on-fire maze. Zack really had no reason to unmask himself. He could have taken off into the cornfield, removed his costume, put some dirt on his face, and escaped back to his friends. His decision to unmask himself meant that he had to kill two people that walked into this hellhole to save him. Since Ollie's never practiced with the taser, it failed to fire at the worst possible moment. Pro tip, if your life depends on a certain thing, make sure you know how to operate it and ensured it works correctly ahead of time. He's lucky that Zack didn't go for the kill shot and couldn't help a monologue for another 10 minutes while Ollie regained his composure. Tip for Zack. If you're going to kill someone, shut the fuck up and kill them. Ollie missing his shot still worked because for all Makani's mistakes, she didn't hesitate when the opportunity presented itself. And unlike Zack, she went for the heart. Zack's plan to frame Makani for all the killings was half-baked and would never have worked. Makani's alibis would all check out. Ali, the son of the deputy, as well as Caleb, both saw the masked killer run off after stabbing Caleb. Zack's ego and theatrics were what cost him his life. Let's recap the decisions which could have altered who lived and died. Jackson should never have followed the trail into the closet kill zone. He had numerous chances to back out and survive. Had he called the police and brought them to his house while Zack was hiding in his parents' closet, they might have caught him before his killing spree began. There was nothing Katie could have done. Had Rodrigo actually ran for his life after exiting the Sanford home, he might have escaped being tased and killed. Caleb survived his wounds, as did Ollie. Alex, Darby, Makani, and the rest of the townsfolk all survived since Zack was an idiot and took his mask off. Even if Zack didn't unveil himself, the killer profile strongly was pointing to him as one of the few candidates in this small town. He would have been found out eventually, unless he skipped a town. I'd say the masked killer from There's Someone Inside Your House was beaten, albeit with a few unstoppable casualties. Thanks for watching, and remember, don't follow an obvious jelly bean trail left by a serial killer.